Today's artist was hell-bent on making his record label eat their words. Uh, determined to groom him to be the next Neil Diamond, they said that his album was complete trash when it sounded nothing like Mr. Forever and Blue Jeans. Not a top 40 hit in sight in their eyes. Ready to walk then and there, this reckless rocker told them to shove it. They didn't want it, someone else would. Turns out someone else did. Five million plus American record buyers and plenty more around the world. By the time this rocker hit number one, he changed his name three times actually. But this hit, this number one hit, gave him the ability to use his real name. It's a story about lost youth, it's a story about all of us. And you're not gonna wanna miss it, coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to get up at the crack of dawn to catch Saturday morning cartoons while eating sugary cereal, you're gonna dig this channel of deep music nostalgia. Story straight from the legends. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you always uh, get what you're looking for here. We also have a Patreon, check that out. There's an additional catalog of exclusive content. You can also become an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. So it's time for another edition of our series, The New Standards. This show takes an in-depth look into songs that transcend genre, decade, and fads. Songs that are monumental touchstones in our culture and our society. And today, we're giving you the story behind Man, what a great song. The 1982 smash, Jack and Diane from John Mellencamp's breakthrough multi-platinum selling album, American Fool. Little ditty about Jack and Diane. Of course, John Mellencamp started out professionally as Johnny Cougar after he signed with Main Man in 1976. It was a stage name given to him by his manager, but he really hated it. Yet that's how his name would appear on his first three albums. 1976's a Chestnut Street Incident, the six-year delayed The Kid Inside that was released in 1983, and 1978's sort of self-titled John Cougar. He would actually headline as John Cougar up until 1983's Uh Huh, when he made the switch to John Cougar Mellencamp. So if you count it, Johnny Cougar, John Cougar, John Cougar Mellencamp, John Mellencamp, four different names there. It actually wouldn't be until 1991's Whenever We Wanted that John would finally drop the Cougar and go by his preferred moniker, his own name, John Mellencamp. Uh, he had earned that right and then some. Today's album, American Fool, would prove to be a key moment in forging John's musical identity. His massive success gave him the clout to use his real last name. But even more importantly, focus in on creating the style of music that he truly cared about, said John Mellencamp. The image that was given to me by the record company was so far off base who I was and what I wanted to do. I did not want to be Johnny Cougar. I didn't want to sing love songs. I didn't want to be the next Neil Diamond, which is what they wanted. The they that I'm talking about here was John's next label after Main Man, Reva Records, distributed by Polygram in the US. And John and Polygram would butt heads uh, big time for the foreseeable future. Prior to American Fool, John had already broken into the US Top 30 with I Need a Lover. This time, and uh, Ain't Even Done With The Night. Oh, what a great song. But the making of American Fool was a fight for the ages. There was intense pressure coming from the label to break through as John already noted. Uh, the Neil Diamond for the 80s is what they wanted. Speaking of the album, John said, I reckon that if I was gonna really give it one more shot, I wanted it to be my best shot. Then if I blew it, I'd have nobody to blame but myself. Well, honestly, he did almost blow it. The process of writing and recording American Fool started in 1981 and it was a complete mess. Uh, from a reckless motorcycle accident to, to band infighting to record label overreach, it would take a while for John Mellencamp to get this album put together. In fact, something that proved to be both a curse and a blessing uh, was John's determination to produce the record himself. That was a proposal his label did not want to entertain. Actually, though, it wasn't a proposal because when Polygram said no, Mellencamp just dug in his heels until he got exactly what he wanted. John hired Don Gammon, an engineer who had previously worked with Stephen Stills and Neil Young. Don would get producer, co-producer credit when the record was finished. 
However, everything from arrangement to final mix was all on John Cougar, Mellencamp. He was determined to make this record different from anything he or anyone else had ever done. In fact, John said he wanted people to hear the music coming out of car radios and for them to stop dead in their tracks. He wanted it to sound like the Pittsburgh Steelers on a power sweep, like 50,000 stomping fans in the bleachers. It was time to go big or to go home. Now for the first phase of the recording process, the band set up shop at uh, Criteria Studios. It was in Miami, Florida. Going in, Mellencamp's bandmates consisted of Larry Crane and Mike Wanchik on guitar, Kenny Aronoff on drums, Robert Ferd Frank on bass, and Eric Rosser on keys. But going out, that was a different story. Um, Mellencamp and company were perpetually distracted in Florida and probably spent more time cruising the beaches than in the actual studio. Three months passed by and there was very little progress. Frustrations and tempers began to rise and John was in a dark mood whenever he was in the studio. Eventually, a fight broke out between John and bassist Robert Ford Frank. Unstrapping his bass guitar, he tossed it across the room and then he stormed out. He didn't come back. Before their time was up in Miami though, John would also fire Eric Rosser. That whittled the band down to just four musicians. When a Polygram delegation flew in to check on the album, they were mortified that they had made so little progress. John had been racking out quite a studio bill, uh, so they were pretty concerned. They told him to get it together or they were going to drop him. So in the fall of 1981, the band regrouped in Bloomington, in Indiana, uh, with less than half an album in hand. Within a couple of months, they started to make some strides, and by the start of 1982, the band migrated to Cherokee Studios up in L.A., and they were ready to wrap things up. But uh, while they were there, they got a surprise visit from one of the label's uh, vice presidents. He was dressed in a pink shirt and completely out of his mind. He heard nothing that he liked. As Mike Wanchik tells, he sat and listened to what we had and he made a fatal comment. He said, you know, I think this needs horns on it. And that was it for John Mellencamp. There was a side door from the studio that opened out into the alley and John flung the door open he shoved this guy through it right into the street and he slammed the door back shut. I guess you could say that John was sick of the interference, didn't want horns on his album. Now, as we further break down this classic, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, if you're in need of prescription frames, sunglasses, reading glasses, you name it, Zenny is going to be your best choice. Over 80% off regular retail prices with a variety that will blow your mind. You can choose whatever you want. Click on the link right up here in this right-hand corner, and you'll get the special deal today. Oh, yeah. Life goes on. Now, in the meantime, Polygram's big wigs arranged listening sessions uh, for the album. And you know what? Yeah, you guessed it. They were not happy. Every Armani suit there thought every single song on American Fool was complete garbage. That's what they said. John, for his part, could see it coming. But by this point, he was confident that American Fool was the best record of his life, and once again, he dug in his heels. A follow-up listening session was set up in New York. This time, uh, John was in the room. Holding in the anger, John sat there for hours listening to the executives trash the album. They said, the album, it's too rough, it's too ragged, it's going to ruin your career. There's nothing like it even being played on the radio. What about Hurt So Good? That's what John asked. What about that? Yeah, top 40, maybe. John was furious. Who were these guys? Gammon said, nobody liked the record. We had Jack and Diane and no one recognized it was a hit. It was so typical of the recording business. Truly groundbreaking things nobody ever recognizes until the public gives them validity. Long after the thrill of living is gone. At the time, I think the quote from the record company was, what happened to our Neil Diamond? John had had it. He wasn't giving these guys even an inch. Finally said, either you release the record exactly the way it is, or don't release it at all. I'll take it somewhere else. As you can imagine, that did not go over very well. However, one executive, a guy named Billy Gaff, stood up for John Mellencamp. He said, look, even I didn't like John's last album, and it sold over a quarter of a million. Let's just release the songs and let the kids decide. 
Your job isn't to like the music, it's to sell it. Reluctantly, uh, Polygram agreed to a multi-single strategy. Hurt So Good would be the first one, Jack and Diane would be next, and then Hand to Hold On To would come in third. Everyone needs a hand to hold on to. American Fool was released appropriately on April 1st, 1982, April Fool's Day. And as it turned out, the only real fools were the executives sitting in that cushy office. John Mellencamp was about to blow up with the one-two punch of Hurt So Good and today's featured song, Jack and Diane. Come on, baby, make it hurt so good. Sometimes long after the thrill of living is gone, so. so backtracking to the creation of Jack and Diane, this song was just as chaotic as the rest of American Fool. Guitarist Larry Crane called the song a never-ending battle, and he said that the mixing <laughs> was like editing Ben-Hur. John conceded that the song did take a long time to finish and said that you know, it was because they had to trim down so much instrumentation. He was learning that it's a lot harder to be simple than complex. But really, the main problem was that throughout the songwriting process, John just didn't like this song. He called it a long shot, if you can imagine that. He said, at best, it's a decent novelty song. He thought the words were unoriginal and the song was just too easy to sing along with. Plus, he hated those hand claps. For a while, he seriously considered scrapping it. However, the band, along with his wife Vicky, begged him to reconsider. They all agreed that Jack and Diane was the best song on the album. Eventually, they wore him down, and John had to agree to keep it. Uh, as for the contents of Jack and Diane, it actually started out without its two legendary protagonists. Instead, it had uh, a different lead. Its title was Jenny at 16. Diane's debutante backseat of Jackie's car. With this initial swipe, John wanted to stir things up. He envisioned the two protagonists as an interracial couple. However, John's label strongly pushed back and ultimately Jenny became Diane and Jack became a wannabe football star. Jack is gonna be a football star. But the story of Jack and Diane was really never intended to make a social statement. Rather, its lyrics and message were derived from John's nostalgic youth. In 1979, John said, just the other day I was telling Larry Crane, I was thinking about writing a song saying, I trade everything I've got right now for just one night of youth again. And you know what? That's what Jack and Diane is. It's John Mellencamp's longing to go back to his youth. It's all of our longing, really. The song opens, underselling itself, a little ditty about Jack and Diane, two American kids growing up in the heartland. Two American kids growing up in the heartland. I mean, it's a perfect introduction. But you know, this song, it's about so much more than that. It's anthemic. It's an iconic testimony in Nostalgia Pack tribute to all of our youth. I mean, there's more nostalgia crammed in the four plus minute song than should be legally allowed. It's that good. Oh yeah, life goes on. I mean, think about it. Whether or not you've ever had dreams of being a football star or eating chili dogs outside a Tasty Freeze. Sucking on chili dog outside Tasty Freeze. Or you've been a debutante in the backseat of a car. This song, it's for you. It's for you, it's for me, it's, it's for everyone who's ever lived a carefree youth. Anybody who's ever fallen in love and then had to grow up afterwards. Long after the thrill. Of living is gone to walk on. Jack and Diane simultaneously takes you back to the glory days of youth and reminds you of the hard-hitting reality that life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. Such wisdom, such jukebox poetry. Oh yeah, life goes on. Jack and Diane may have been soaked deep in the magic of teen romance, they know just as well as we do that it can't go on forever. Long after the thrill of living is gone. Hold on to 16 as long as you can. You know, it's what he pleads. Changes come around real soon, make us women and men. Oh, it's so good. Oh, hold on to 16 as long as you can. We all come face to face with growing up, whether we like it or not. And 
Though at first we may resist, we eventually adjust. We change, we make the best of it. And in the process of discovering joy and fulfillment in places that we really never expected when we were young. Changes come around real soon, make us women and men. David Mascriata, author of Mel and Cap American Troubadour, he sums it up so well. He says, even as this couple is having fun and experiencing the, the thrill of romance, there's this underlying element of sadness, uh, the awareness that their youth and perhaps their youthful carefree quality will soon come to an end and adulthood will bring its own joys. But it will also bring its own responsibilities and its own burdens. So it's actually a pretty complicated song about the human experience. I mean, really, John Hughes said it best, when you grow up, your heart dies. When you grow up, your heart dies. The videos for Hurt So Good, Hand to Hold On To, and Jack and Diane were all finished before American Fool was released. Uh, but initially, you know, since the record company could care less about the album, Jack and Diane wasn't slotted to get a video. So according to Paul Flattery, uh, who worked for the video production company, John made a special request. After the videos for Hurt So Good and The Hand To Hold On To were finished, he said, look, there's a song on the album that the label doesn't believe in, but I do. Can you do me a favor and save one roll of film? Shoot me singing the song. I'll give you some old photos and stuff, and then you can just cobble it all together for me. And they did. And that's what happened. Uh, the video for Jack and Diane would only cost uh, a couple thousand bucks to make compiled from John's high school photos and some Super 8 home movies of him and his wife, Vicky, just hanging out in Indiana. Uh, the couple really donned the roles of Jack and Diane, just a few years their senior, actually. Dribble off those Bobby Brooks, let me do what I please. But the two make the perfect Heartland heroes. At one point, John even has Vicky on his lap with his hands between her knees. It's like the song says. Diane sitting on Jackie's lap, got his hands between the knees. Along with her so good, Jack and Diane got major airplay on MTV and helped propel the song up the Billboard charts, and in turn, it changed the course of John Mellencamp's career. Now, speaking of her so good, that would climb all the way to number two on the Hot 100. However, by the time it reached number 10, the label took a big gamble and released Jack and Diane. I mean, typically record companies would wait for the current single to start falling back down the charts before issuing the next one. However, in this case, the gamble really paid off. The response was overwhelming. While Hurt So Good had clicked with top 40 audiences, Jack and Diane started gaining traction on AOR stations. It was a record company's dream come true. Two hot singles work in multiple markets at the same time, and they were actually in the top 10 at the same time as well. Very rare feat in the 80s. Only a few people accomplished that. Let the Bible bail, come and save my soul. Ultimately, of course, Jack and Diane went to number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and the Cashbox chart. It did well internationally as well. Went to number 25 in the UK, number 12 in South Africa, number seven in Australia, and it went to number one in Canada. Hard to believe as it is, Jack and Diane is John Mellencamp's only number one hit of his career. As I just mentioned, Hurt So Good it just missed out at number two. So did ROCK in the USA, it went to number two. CK in the USA, ROCK in the USA. However, John would have seven number ones on the mainstream rock chart. Although curiously, Jack and Diane was not one of them, topped out at number three. But based on streams and downloads, there is no doubt that Jack and Diane is Mel and Camp's most popular song. It's, a, it's an American standard, as we've talked about. Oh yeah, life goes on. So I was surprised to discover that Jack and Diane only has a couple of media placements, including Cold Case and Fresh Off the Boat. There have been a lot of covers though, uh, renditions by Better Than Ezra, Keith Urban's done it, John Mayer, Taylor Swift actually did it. So give it up in this place today! Let's do it! Fun, Bare Naked Ladies, Toe the West Sprocket, and his friend Billy Joel. Oh yeah, life goes 
Jack and Diane is absolutely one of John Mellencamp's signature songs. Definitely a fan favorite, in concert, on the radio, still played today. It's been going strong for decades, and it will never slow down, in my opinion. 2008, John was asked if uh, it bothered him that he was best known for writing Jack and Diane. His response was, that song is 30 or so years old, and it gets played more today in the United States than it did when it came out. As much as I'm a little weary of those two, I don't know any other two people in rock and roll who are more popular than Jack and Diane. Some people probably think there's a place in hell for me because of those two people. But it gave me the keys to do what I want. I've lived the way I've wanted to live. That's what Jack and Diane gave me, so I can't hate them too much. End of quote. Long after the thrill of living is gone. Of course, even more time has passed since then. That was 2008. I can't imagine Mellencamp's opinion has changed too much, but I think that as long as Jack and Diane have a place in all of our hearts, they'll have a place in John's as well. It's always been a favorite song of mine. It's a sing-along ditty that gets better and more personal to me with every passing year because I'm still holding on to 16 as long as I can. How about you? Two American kids doing best they can. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about John Mellencamp and Jack and Diane's perfect song. What are your memories of the song? What are your memories of American Fool? John Mellencamp came and he was the king of Heartland Rock, man. Uh, tell us about your, your opinion on his other songs. Uh, one of the greatest American poets ever. And if you like our content, we would invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our content, uh, as part of our channel. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.